I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ecrastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Hello, this is Spencer with the MacGuffin, and I'm joined by Robbie, let me see, Pickering? Is that the Pickering. Pickering. Pickering, okay. Pickering. Uh, Pickering. I mean, you could do it any way you want, now that you're, like, a star director, you know, yeah. making the rounds. There's not many ways to produce my, or pr pronounce my name. <laughs> You'd be amazed at what yeah. people do. Um, you are the writer and director of Natural Selection. Yes. Um, film sort of buzzing in the indie world these days. You know, it's playing at SIF right now. Um, while we talk about this film, um, you are both the writer and director. Why don't you give us sort of the pitch for Natural Selection for the people who are out there who are just like, we love indie films. Tell us about your film. Well, like the pitch for the story? Sure, yeah. Uh, it's basically like a coming-of-age story for a 40-year-old woman, <laughs> which I know to most of you geeks out there really makes you want to go see that movie. But Coming uh, of age stories are so awesome though. Like I, I think they, a lot of they people They are. Like They've it. gotten kind of old hat now, right? No. I don't no. think they ever will. It's I not mean, like a stolen summer coming of age story. It's funner than that. It's like a uh, Harold and Maude coming coming of age. Not that Harold and Maude did you Well, it is. it is. Every story is a coming of age story. I, I mean in, way. in some sense, but I mean I think I think the the specific genre that's sort of like coming of age I think is is one that will it's kind of timeless in some ways because you know everyone can relate to it. Because everybody ages. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, th I think there's something universally enjoyable about that. Um, how did you come up with this? Like, this seems like such a. Uh, it's an interesting concept, but like you're a young male. Like, how did right. you come about? And writing? I guess the movie is about a woman in Texas. She's like a Christian woman. Um, who can't have children, and, and it's pretty stringent co Christian community, and in that community, that's kind of a mark of shame. And but her husband has been a saint about it for going on 25 years now, um, until she finds out that he's been jerking off in a sperm <laughs> clinic for 24 years because he gets a stroke there, and she finds out he's basically populated the Southwest mm. um, to kind of fulfill his genetic. Duty, uh, duties, and yes. um, and uh, so she, rather than she's the type of woman that rather than feel m angry at him and all that, she feels all those things, but she feels more guilty, and like she drove him to these ends, and so he asked to see his eldest son before he before he passes away, and so she goes she goes to find him, and the the rest of the journey is to find this guy, and he's you know. He's like a guy you see on reruns of Cops. Sure, sure. He's a piece of shit. And these two get put together, and it's kind of this story about her and the kid, Raymond, who's like 23 years old um, and lives in Florida. So how did I come up with yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, it seems like all of this, like, did you come from, like, a Christian background? I did, So, yeah. So you have some sort of idea of the community that this might exist in. Exactly. I, I, well, yeah, but I exaggerated a lot of things. But, I, I, you know, I think, like, for instance, the, the woman's uh, Linda, the main character, is played by Rachel Harris. Her husband w won't have sex with her. I never knew anybody like that, but I knew, like, the, the house next door, they didn't use contraception mm. because it was against God's. Right. Kind of, so they couldn't afford it, but they had, like, 14 kids. <laughs> and it's just ridiculous. And, you know, people always have a knack of cherry-picking things from the Bible mm. to fit their own kind of... Not really, it's so. about a loveless... Ma she's stuck in a loveless marriage, and he's kind of used, like, biblical justifications for his own kind of neuroses and dependencies, and b dependencies, and b both of them have. And I think that's pretty common uh, across religions. I mean... Yeah. From okay. Osama bin Laden to, you know... <laughs> um, you know, Newt Gingrich. Um, and you know, that whole people that stripe. So, so yeah, I grew up in that community and I, I'd always wanted to do a story about someone like my mom. Um, but I never had kind of an, an emotional window mm. into her story. And then I found out that my stepdad, uh, had terminal cancer and he was going to die. And I just wanted at that point, I was just fearful of my mom being alone. A woman like my mom is very sheltered being alone sure. for the first time in her life. And so, I wrote this story kind of out of fear of what she would, and kind of put my mom into this kind of crazy situation that I made up. Um, and all the 
sperm clinic stuff and that th those were actual existential crises i was going through i used to give sperm at the uh, empire state building when i was at, when i went to nyu but it was like for existential reasons. Right, right. No, 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 it was. It was. No, no, I, I believe you. It was you. because I, you know, searching for the meaning. You know, you're searching for meaning when you're in college and stuff like that. And the only thing I think you can grasp onto that's not just philosophical bullshit, because this, you know, is you're passing on genetic material. Natural selection, survival of the fittest, you know? But, I mean, I think there's a certain degree of, you know, just, I mean, even just you talk philosophically, I think there's sort of like, you know... A butterfly effect sort of idea of like you know you do one thing you yeah. wonder what the the fallout of that are and you know when you do something like give sperm you, you know you wonder like if if somebody has a kid what my, my yeah. kid would turn out to be like and that sort of stuff like it's an interesting sort of I, I I I uh, I had no I had no thoughts about the sperm after I gave it. I was just like I'm passing on business. my genetic material. It was all business. I always think I'll be in New York one day and I'll be walking down the street. I'll pass some blonde kid with his mom, and we'll both get you know like 50 feet past each other, and then turn back, and there'll be like this weird thing between us. Like that's my kid. Uh, I but but no, it was all business for me, man. Like... It was all the business of a uh, of a. Uh, meaning you know that's 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 what you know that's so, what it's all about so you've written this script um i mean you haven't uh got a heck of a lot of stuff on your you know resume so no. to speak at this point how do you go about you know getting this made and once you get people interested how do you go about not having it like you know cannibalized because you you directed it yeah it, se it seems like it would have been a lot easier for them to be like you're not a named director we can kick you out you know bring in you know somebody of some stature and just give it to them and sell bigger stars or something like that you know that's what hollywood does how do you how do yeah, you sort of hollywood's bullshit well know? that's what i'm saying how do you maintain that integrity of your project like how do you keep it to be your own? You just gotta have balls, man, <laughs> and you have you have to have written it. I mean, if you if you got that script and you aren't willing to sell out for it, and you believe you can direct it, and you believe it's a great script, now there are a lot of people out there with horrible scripts who oh, yeah. who think the same thing and are like, I'm gonna. It's like, dude, that's an awful script. Like, but <laughs> I I thought and I knew that my script was good and. There were a lot of, you know, people of stature who wanted to direct it and things like that, but fuck them. What stature? You know, like... I mean, it's, it's just sort of like, you know, Hollywood... Tom Shadjack has stature, <laughs> but he, he's a horrible director. I mean, yeah, it's like, Uwe Boll, people know him as a name brand. I yeah. Don't, but, like, it's, it's sort of one of those things that Adam Hollywood... Adam Shankman has stature. Yeah. Okay, I shouldn't do that because I'm good. <laughs> yeah, but he's really good. Yeah, Hollywood likes name properties because they thinks they can sell them. Like, I, I mean, it seems it seems like you know it could have been easy for you to be like, give me fifty thousand dollars. Like, I don't. I mean, I don't care once you give me the money. But you seem to really like this means something to you. Like, yeah. I, it was about my. It was about where I grew up, and it's about my mother, and it's about. It's not just about my mother. It's about me dealing with death for the first time. Yeah. So, and it's about me dealing with real things in my life, and me dealing with, uh, you know, thinking about death through the kind of prism of, of my mother, and you know. I, I think I would have regretted it for the rest of my life if I'd given it to somebody else. Because sure. fuck them. They can't do a better job than I can. If you know you can do a better job of it and you know it's in your head, fuck whoever's in Hollywood and whoever thinks... <laughs> like, that's that's how they maintain... That's how they keep people... Like, that's how they buy scripts and then never do them. And that's how they buy great... There are a million great scripts in Hollywood that are Paramount or Sony or Warner Brothers that are just sitting there. That's how they do that. Oh, totally. They take the script, they pay you a bunch of... Now, if you can... I also knew that I can make my script for a low budget. You know, if you've got a... You aren't going to be able to make, you know... Uh, you know, if you wrote, you know, True Lies, you aren't going to be <laughs> able to make that... For you know, a little for budget, for, yeah. for like under a million dollars or under five hundred thousand dollars, but <laughs> my script I knew I could make it for a budget, and it was hard finding people who believe in you. But if you have a good script, you know actors. I think that's no mystery. They're all. I mean, there's there's so little good work in Hollywood mm -hmm. now that you can get in 
with a reasonable amount of like contacts and all that, you can get into actors if you have a good script. But a good script in, in anywhere in the film business is token of the realm. You, all that's worth anything anywhere in the movie business is a script. That's it. That's it. Because that's what a movie is. And that's, that's kind of... If you have a good script, you know, everybody wants a good script. You know, okay, but you've got you've got a good script. You just happen to write it. Um, yeah. How do I mean? How do you go about you know putting this as sort of like a project together and sort of sell you know selling it to producers and then you know yeah. as as a director? I mean, how much directing experience had, had you had before this? I mean, you had it in your head clearly, exactly. yeah. but like, how do you how do you translate that sort of to the final product? Well, I a, had I had like a lot of uh, you know it wasn't just in my head. I had storyboarded the whole movie. I had um, like years before I ever did it, I had photo like a, a photo lookbook with Hito photographs, Bertensky, you know, just to give a feel for the movie, crudes and stuff, uh, uh, Philip Lorca de Corsia, all those things. And then, you know, so, so when producers met with me, they knew I had my shit together mm. to get to those producers. I, I had a manager, I had done short films in college. So off of those, I had a manager, um, and she just sent it around to producers. Now the producers I got with initially, this was six years ago. The producers wow. I got with initially, I was with them for two years and we went to everybody in Hollywood, like actress wise. And a lot of the agents won't even give it to the actress. Mm. They'll just say they do. And I, I doubt many of the actresses sure. we gave it to even read it. But we finally found an actress for it. And then my producers informed me. We were going to do it for a lot bigger budget back then. And th when I got the actress, my producers were like, we don't have the money. We were lying to you the whole time, basically. Jeez. So it, that was really annoying. And, th and then I took it away from them. And I, I, I found another set of... And these guys were like UPMs with just unit production managers. These mm -hmm. guys were not producers yet, but they mm -hmm. were hungry. They wanted to be producers. And so my script off, there was something I had to gain from them and something they had to gain from me. And I think in indie film, that's a good way to do it with producers and things like that. You find people who are, who are like coming up. You don't get, I, I mean, you know, it goes different ways. Like I know for for like a lot of movies, like I know, I know Martha um, Martha Macy May Marlene or whatever, mm, yeah. they got to Ted Ho, but you know or whatever. <laughs> but they those guys had already at, at Borderline is the thing they do, right? They, yeah, yeah. they had already had like they had, I think they had already had some buzz. He was in the Sundance Lab for somebody who like me, who didn't have nobody knew about my script. Um, you know, some people in Hollywood did because I was on this thing called the Blacklist. I yeah, had, yeah, yeah. I was on that, so I had some visibility. Wow. But yeah, yeah, I was on that with this script. I I had some visibility, but um, that was mostly to get hired for writing jobs. Which I mean, it definitely looks like you've succeeded because I mean, according to at least IMDb, you have at least four projects you're attached to as a writer. Yeah. I don't know if that is in fact accurate because IMDb can be notoriously inaccurate. Well, they're different now. I'm writing Bugs Bunny for Warner's. Wow, uh, that's yeah, kind of that's an interesting thing, one. especially. I mean, growing yeah. up as a kid, that must be kind of oh, like totally. A dream. Because we're like we're our pitch. Oh, God, I can't really talk about it, but let's just say I'm going back to basics Bugs Bunny. It's not Space Jam Bugs Bunny. It's back to 40s and 50s Groucho <laughs> Marx Bugs Bunny. Are you implying a Space Jam Bugs Bunny is not the ideal one? Space Jam isn't such a bad movie. It's not a and terrible the movie. And the first 20 or 30 minutes of Looney Tunes back in action are okay. But we're like, we're like making a Bugs movie. Which is kind of funny because, you know, Hollywood seems to be sort of recapturing a lot of these people, you know, like Jason Segel taking on the Muppets totally. and all that sort of stuff. So it's yeah. sort of good to see these Cause characters Because the people who are running the studios now are like the people who who grew up watching the Muppets, mm -hmm. you know, and know what the great thing about the... I think, I think you know, all that stuff got to a point where you had people running the studios who were like, let's see how we can cash in on, on Bugs Bunny. Let's see how we can cash in on the Muppets or something like that. And, totally. and And now I think the people coming up with Bugs, it's a little different. It's like they want to, I think, reinvent it a little. But with uh, Muppets especially, I think you have real fans of the Muppets in there. I mean, you you got 
I mean, Jason Siegel and all them are, are perfect to do it, I think. Yeah. You know, you want geeks making these movies. Totally, you don't people want... who love the characters. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's like with any... I, I want to see Edgar Wright do, like... like, like so I want to see him do Tom and Jerry or something That would be, awesome. like that. be awesome. I think he's doing Ant-Man. So, or he Is was he? attached to Ant-Man, so I'm kind of curious to see how I want to see plays. somebody do The Tick as a movie. It, I the tick has been one of those characters that's sort of been maligned, unfortunately, for a long time Why? because I, of that TV show. You know, you know, no, but that was an all right. TV it was a show. fine TV show, but it just didn't succeed. So people no. oh, sort yeah, of yeah. look at it as a failure. I used to my first job in LA was uh, giving out um, keys in a locker room, like an like a like an upscale Beverly Hills, um, uh, like and this was just out of college, um, a. Uh, upscale Beverly Hills gym mm -hmm. and I gave it keys in the locker room men's locker room so I had to look at balls all day <laughs> I saw Don Knotts balls I saw Jimmy Kahn's balls I saw I saw and the I think the creator of the tick everybody was like that's the creator of the tick I've seen all these guys naked that's that's uh that's Don what? Knotts naked <laughs> that's some good stuff <laughs> so things are getting uncomfortable now. No, they're not. Then Don Knotts, we talk about that three, four times a week. Minimum. James Conn, I went up to him one day. And he wasn't naked. I made sure he wasn't naked, but uh, I was like, J "Like, hey, Mr. Conn, I just, you know, I just watched El Dorado the other day. Like, you're great in it. El Dorado is basically real Bravo with James Conn in the uh, Ricky Nelson part, and he has this sawed-off shotgun the whole time. It's not very good, but um, it's." A, I think it's Howard Hawks, yeah. And he was like, what? What are you talking about? And I was like, El, El Dorado? <laughs> and I was like, it's your first movie that you in. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. And then he like just, he was like, get the fuck out of here. I'm Jimmy Kahn. Yeah, that's sort of how I I gotta wash off my balls. <laughs> I gotta take a schwitz. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, pretty... it's good to know you've you made your way up in the world since then, you know. I never approached Don Knotts about the ghost of Mr. Chicken. <laughs> Mrs. Chicken, Mr. Chicken. <laughs> I don't even know. Which one is that? The Apple Either Dump one Apple sounds Dumpling awesome. Gang? Did uh, you ever see Apple Dumpling Gang? Years ago. I mean, it's been years. That's a whole thing that, I don't know, those, those shitty Disney movies from like the 60s. Hey, you know, they brought back like Herbie and stuff. So Flubber. Flubber, the brand back to so that's probably going to be rebooted at some point. Knowing the way Hollywood, you think going. they'll be bring back the 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 apple dumpling gang? I would not be surprised at all. Oh god, they recycle <laughs> everything. So you get you get your producers finally. You got your script. You're directing. Um, what's that casting process like? What's it like? You know, getting Rachel on board and John Gray's and all these other right. people. Well, it's different for all of them. Rachel, when we. Basically, I got with these new producers, and we decided to just slash the budget and do it for a lot cheaper than we were going to do it. Mm -hmm. And by that, you know, that scared off the actress who we had. The actress who we had also, she had been attached for a long time. She's a wonderful actress, and uh, I'm probably going to do something else with her at some point. But she... Um, she kind of couldn't do it and stuff like that, and she got off. And it sucked for a little, but then... We at that point we were casting also the the second role in the movie, which was uh, which eventually meant, went to Matt O'Leary, mm. uh, who's the kid in Frailty, and yeah, yeah, um, he, he's been a lot of stuff. And as a kid actor, and now is like twenty two right now, and we needed somebody that age, and and so we were already auditioning uh, kid guys for that role, and so the the bad news was we had to start auditioning for the lead role and and we were so close to going down to texas for pre-production it was really scary so I started meeting with a bunch of actresses and we had gotten a, a casting director on now casting directors like you need them to add some legitimacy to your project but there are a lot of casting directors out there who if the script's good you know and you can get to them they'll do it for not much money mm. and um so through them we were able to get to certain actors and certain agencies and and be taken seriously um and we i met with a lot of really extremely talented dramatic actresses um and then they brought up rachel and i don't you know i'd only seen her as everyone else has seen her you know i'd only seen her 
I'd seen her in Reno 911 and, and The Hangover. Right, and, right. And uh, Fat Actress and uh, all these things she was in. And um, she always plays like kind of the bitch role. And I said, no way. She's, she's horrible for it, you know. And But I met with her anyway be, to be nice and, and all that. And, and, you know, everybody... I knew with everybody there could be a slight chance that they'd be good for the role, even mm -hmm. if I had turned them down. And it was thought not initially. And as soon as I met with her, I kind of got the sense from her. And then I asked her to go in an audition, and she agreed to do it. And she came in, and she was... She would say she wasn't, but I, I think she was a little nervous. And, and I... But I could tell she was just great for the role. And so I cast her. Um she had to drop out at a certain point and really scared the shit out yeah. of us. But, and, and, and I, and I had to go with another actress for a little while. And, and I really didn't think this other actress was right for it. She was my second choice. Mm. I didn't think she was right for it. Um, and in the meantime, um, uh, Rachel had some pr other things that she had to do. Sure. And, and, um, and everybody around me was, I, I just wanted to contact her, and everybody was like, You can't do that. After she's passed on it, you can't. And finally, I was like, Fuck this. I've got to. I just had a feeling in my gut, and I Facebook messaged her and like spent three hours crafting the perfect message. And she emailed me back in an hour and was like, Yeah, I'll do it for sure. Wow, that's, that's. Um, so the next week she was down there, and, and, and uh, she blew us all away. And it, it we we didn't have any idea. I didn't have any idea of what she was capable of. I mean, if there's one reason to go see this movie, it's Rachel Harris. So. Well, I mean, you got to appreciate, you know, this is, what, six years of yeah. build-up for you to finally get to this point where, you know, you're finally filming the movie. Like, yeah. how, how much of a relief, how much of excitement to finally be doing it? Like, what is that moment where you're finally walking on the scene like, this is finally fucking happening? Like, <laughs> after six years... <laughs> that's what I'm saying. After like, six years, I can tell you that that moment is completely underwhelming yeah. it's really? like because you're you're so tired at that point you're like, you're like i just want this fucking be over you're with you're like you're like okay okay it's i mean imagine if you are engaged for seven years and then your wedding day comes in comes you'll just be like ah, really all right Let's I don't know. I, I think I would be pretty excited if I had been like cycled in and out, and finally this thing that's like clearly, you know, something that's from, it's, it's it's like a it's like piece. it's like objectively you're so excited, but like subjectively and in, in your in, you know in your in your being, you do not have the capacity to be excited <laughs> anymore. You've been so just completely obliterated by the system and, and and the thing is it's not all bad you've done so much prep but that you're ready for anything that comes your it's way six years six years is a long time it is exciting but you know okay so maybe you're not fully excited at this point you finish the film i'm definitely excited i'm just not like crazy excited yeah you know i'm not like ha cha cha yeah, sure, sure, i made sure, it sure. you know okay how about when you finish the film at that point that's it really I'm really exhausted okay. <laughs> that point, so you... after an 18 day shoot and just like wow, going 18 days. yeah after Woof. going full throttle i can tell you i can tell you definitely at the end of that you are not excited <laughs> you're like you're like going over everything you've done and uh, you know Oh my God! I didn't get this. I didn't get that. It fucking sucks. Uh, what if it? What if it sucks? Oh my God! What's my editor gonna say? You know, like you're killing yourself. I can tell you, fourth month of editing is when I got excited. Okay. That's when I got excited because I was like, I'm finding what this movie is. And is that the time you're about ready to start submitting it to festivals and whatnot? I I would say second month of editing, but. No, that's that's rough cut. That's when you're first showing it to people. I mean, the way I do it, I have a bunch of rough cut sure, screens where yeah. where I bring in people I trust. You know, I, you know, showed it to to a lot of filmmakers I trust. Mm. I just showed it to Nicole Hulfson and J. J. Wow. and jo Josh Leonard and um, good a, 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 a lot of people like that who are good friends of mine sure, or, yeah. or mentors of mine or whatever and. I know they know how to look at a rough cuz looking at a rough cut is you got to be able to see what the it could be 
Like, yeah, I mean the first first guy we showed it to was not was Rodrigo Garcia, who's not my friend but my editor's friend and and that was immensely helpful because he, you know when somebody like that is looking when you're looking at my movie and it's two and a half hours or two I think at that point it was two hours long the movie is an hour and a half long right now mm -hmm. not only is the movie have a lot more shit in there that's awful and you notice one minute of shit that's awful imagine if it's you know, thir cumulatively 30, 40 minutes of shit. And not only that, but the movie's the movie itself is is totally different. You know, it, 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 the editing process is a writing process, and and in in most of my scripts, I go through. 17 18 revisions wow. you know? not full revisions right, they're just but, like I mean, switching yeah, stuff around sure, sure. stuff like that so like you have to and with screenwriting too you have to have somebody who knows what that looks like and knows what's good about and directing actors as well it's like you got to know that when an actor's doing something that you doesn't fit into what you envisioned it's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe the performance is bad right now, but maybe there's some spark of something in there. You got to be able to recognize that. So, so when you're doing a rough cut or something like that, you need that same thing. You need a guy who's gonna, you know, a few people who are gonna know how to watch that cut, you know, and and have been through the process sure, before. Sure. So, I mean, so you you do all these re revisions, you know, you tweak and you tweak and you tweak, and you get to a point where you're happy with it. You start making festivals, you know. You yeah. you guys got into South by Southwest, I know. Yeah, that was um, exciting. I was excited about that. Like that, I mean, that must be cool. But even cooler had to be, you know, winning both the grand jury prize mm. and the audience award, because that's not a very common thing to have. Both, you know, the sort of filmmakers appreciate your film as well as an audience, like. How, does that sort of like really finally once and for all tell you that you're onto something? I mean, you know in your head you believe in your project right. and you, you believe it's going to be good, but when you actually see other people who are not your friends or right. not your like co workers or whatever right. appreciating something, that's got to be the moment where you're like, okay, you know, we did it. This is right. You know, it was worth the trouble. It was, it was a great moment. I mean, and winning all that stuff was definitely uh, uh, it, w it was a high point but I I kind of knew before that because I had been in screenings mm -hmm. where people were laughing at parts that surprised me and mm -hmm. and and I, I know from the feeling in the theater you know I know I mean the highest point of my life thus far, you know, has been, you know, watching Roger Ebert watch the movie, you know? That's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, an award is, I, I'm very appreciative of the awards and I love them and I love it for the crew that works so hard and I love that it's something that we can be proud of. For me personally, having Roger Ebert even watch my movie was the high point. I mean, when you think of the world of film, he's got to be one of the first things that pops to I, mind. I was just talking with my friend Brendan, who produced a, a really excellent film called Cold Weather um, recently. That was at South by Southwest last year. And we were talking about Roger Ebert, and we figured out that when we were kids, he grew up, I think, oh, God, I don't even know where, Podunk, Wisconsin <laughs> or Ohio or something like that. And I grew up in Houston. Among, huh. We both grew up among people who didn't really know film, and we were really for some reason or another we really you know there's a, a type of kid who really just digs it up whether it's a, like a cinephile who's a horror and zombie movie and comic book geek i was a kind of a foreign film geek and kind mm -hmm. of a art film geek they're different types but it's all people who like for one reason or another are just crazy drawn to like stores like this no you know? totally and and I was talking to him, and we both had this CD um, when we were kids called Cinemania, Microsoft Cinemania, and it had a, I think it had all of Roger Ebert's review or a bunch wow. of them. So it was it was before the uh, before yeah. I had internet, and internet was what, and so we had this CD, and I, you know, I I and and we were talking about how we both, he's more meaningful to me than almost any director. Roger Ebert. I can, I can. Because totally. he's like, he was like, he's been my, you know, 
this sounds really uh, too sentimental, but he's been my film teacher since I was 13. I think I think a lot of people would agree with you on that. I mean, he really. I mean, you know, from his reviews, his commentaries, his his show. Like, I mean, he really introduced the world to so many films. One of the high, but the high point of my life before this was I was at the Hamptons Film Festival. My my second short film. I had two short films that won there, and the second wow. time I was there, I um I uh was there when Roger Ebert was there, and. He was in a bookstore, and I got to talk to him about this Ozu film called Record of a Tenement Gentleman for probably five minutes. And I just kept talking to It was a QA and a thing, and everybody was annoyed to, at me because I just kept talking. It was the same way P.T. Anderson did a Q&A when I was at NYU about Punch Drunk Love, and I kept talking to him, and, and, and everybody was annoyed at me. And then Roger Ebert signed my uh, DVD of Citizen Kane, and I we got invited to Roger Ebert's Film Festival wow. this year, and I got to bring that citizen kane dvd to him and be like this was yeah. you didn't know at the time and he but... signed and he signed my roger ebert's video companion from uh 96 which has the cover torn off and all that and that's awesome for film i think for any from for a lot of film geeks especially if you're an american film geek and and especially even internationally i mean he's he's such a world, he's a kind of a yeah but uh, you know there's a certain like there's a certain midwestern quality to his um criticism which is he's not beholden to kind of the intelligentsia i hate that word it sounds like i'm a glenn beck <laughs> acolyte but on the in, on the east coast or the or the kind of douchebags sure. west coast he's just like and those are both like caricatures there are great critics on both coasts but he's always come at this from this like pure midwestern kind of like it's kind of almost a purist no i totally know. i totally understand what you're saying um so you know you get roger ebert to watch your film all these <laughs> yeah. all these awesome things are happening what what is next for natural selection i mean obviously it's playing here at sif um probably other festivals thereafter yeah, we're doing la little rock jerusalem wow that's gonna bergen. be bergen cool. bergen is in norway that's gonna be great we're doing london which is a big one in October. Um, so, do, is, do you imagine like uh, has it gotten a distributor yet? You know, are you? Yeah, gonna... there are a couple kind of vying for it right now. So, presumably, at some point, it'll have a theatrical di distribution. It will. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, hopefully, fall. When when can people who are not it's in it's these kind of wonderful city. That's kind of not my like. It's whenever they close that we have sales reps at a uh, at, at, at company in uh, at ICM and and their kind of negotiating all that now um we're getting into the nitty-gritty of that soon well so hopefully hopefully it's it'll a whole be soon. process um where can people find out more information about the film does it have a website right and all um if if they want they should definitely friend the film or like the film on facebook uh to Sometimes. always get up we we're very good about that updates it's natural selection dash the movie uh, on Facebook um, and then uh, on Twitter we have a Twitter account you, I don't know how you find us on Twitter but just type I'll, in natural I'll put, selection I'll put a little in Twitter and then here. and then uh, our website is natural movie all one word dot com and that all that will give you updates and all that and um, how about for you personally do you have a website I mean pe I'm sure people like once they see this film and know you wrote and directed it they're going to wonder what where they can keep up with you know this and I the used, Bugs Bunny I, I, movie I, I, I used to have a website but um, it's under construction right now because I've got to update it but they can go ahead and friend me on Facebook I, I take all comers so Robbie Pickering <laughs> www.facebook.com slash Robbie Pickering R-O-B-B-I-E-P-I-C-K-E-R-I-N-G and you I I don't discriminate on Facebook friends Miranda July does that I shouldn't say that <laughs> well you know people will come to you then you know you're a man of the people we, yeah. lo we love that um, I don't have Twitter I got kicked off Twitter because I, I was spamming about my movie. When we were, we were, they can go on. Nat, what is it, Rachel? Nat sell the movie. Nat sell the movie. Oh. I don't have Twitter personally because we were in this contest and I was spamming on Twitter and Twitter kicked me off. They, they're like, my, 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 my email is banned on Twitter, so I can't. 
Well, we'll promote you since you can't do it for yourself. Please, we need it. Thank you, Robbie, and I look thank forward you. to seeing what's next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And thank you for listening or watching. Can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. It's tight, don't even try to buy the size of that. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Rathacon can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, I'm on f